Let's read Head Shoots. Year One The Rule of Prague. War. War never changes. The hame of severity waged war to gather slaves and wealth. The blowing cactus built an empire from its lust for gold and territory. Sazir's search dikes shaped a battered sword of owning into an economic superpower. But war never changes. In the first century, war was still waged over the resources that could be acquired. Only this time, the spoils of war were also its weapons, adamantine and magma. For these resources, the Doom of Flags would invade the boat of society, the sword of owning would annex the mute continent, and the blanketed nations would dissolve into quarreling, bickering nation-states, bent on conquering the last remaining resources in the realms of enchanting. In 27, the storm of world war had come again. In two brief hours, most of the world was reduced to cinders, and from the ashes of geothermal devastation, a new civilization would struggle to arise. A few were able to reach the relative safety of the large dwarven mountain halls. My family was part of that group that entered palm lanterns, imprisoned safely behind a large drawbridge under a mountain of stone. A generation has lived without knowledge of the outside world. Life in palm lanterns is about to change. Third of Obsidian, 105. There's a problem in palm lanterns. Big one. Our still has given up the ghost. We can't make another one with our limited supplies, and the process is too complicated for a workaround system. Simply put, we're running out of booze. No booze, no palm lanterns. This is crucial to our survival, and the Overseer thinks I, and some of the others, are the only hope we have. He wants us to go find the parts to build a new still. The Overseer says there are around four or five months before Palm Lanterns runs out of booze, and that the Mountain Hall needs a new still. I asked him where I'm supposed to find the parts, but all I got was a nasty glare. I strike out with Swat Jester, Verviticus, Facial Butter, Moto 42, LCQC, and Mr. Green Shirt. The harsh glare of the sun is blinding, and once our eyes adjust and once we stop vomiting all over ourselves, we see nothing but wastelands. Well, at the very least, everything that wasn't underground during the Great Magma Flood of 27 has surely perished. So how dangerous can this be? First of Granite, 106. In celebration of the New Year, I drank heavily. While we dwarves have livers the size of a child's head, even I had a little too much of our supply of booze as we trekked across these blasted wastes. I was sitting atop the wagon leading the mules and having a grand old time. I started singing my finest rendition of the battle hymn of the Dwarven Republic, and all of its glorious profanity in uncensored form, and my boisterousness seemed to weird out the pack mules. They bolted, yanking their yoke off the wagon and causing it to tumble down a hillside, breaking both wheels and toppling supplies everywhere. I then started yelling at the mules to come back, but then to my surprise a skeletal giant eagle itself swept down and slew the pack animals where they stood. Skeletal eagle. There have been a lot of horrible sounding growls and groans from the surrounding countryside. I don't think the locals take too kindly to my vocal talents. Well, forget palm lanterns. This place looks to be as good of a spot as any to hunker down and figure out what to do. A new chapter of dwarven history begins here, at this place. Circus call, head shoots. Strike the earth! Hastily scribbled journal entry. Leaping two-legged rhino lizards! The whole valley is crawling with zombies and skeletons, and it appears the giant skeletal eagle is the welcoming party. We're struck on this barren hillside with the horrible beast not even ten paces to our east hovering in the air. Everybody panics and scatters while the war dogs valiantly pursue the beast. Uh, yeah, dogs? It has wings? Made from bones? I busy myself yelling at the miners, telling them to stop being cowards long enough to take a passageway into the wall to hide ourselves, but Mr. Greenshirt and Pervaticus won't have that shit and hightail it to who knows where. Luckily, the dogs are the eagle's first target. 
The first dog it attacks manages to break off one of the monstrous creature's wings, but then got torn to ribbons. The other two dogs then charge the flightless monster, as Verviticus stopped panicking long enough to start carving ourselves a survival bunker. Finally, the eagle fell to pieces and stopped moving. Never underestimate a dog's hunger when he hasn't had so much as a bone to nibble on for weeks. With that grisly business out of the way, I promote the dogs to the city guard and have them watch over our most important resource, me. Charisma is not a dump stat. <laughs> They'll see. Fifth of Granite, 106. As Verviticus and Mr. Greenshirt dig away, I have the mason, Moto 42, construct a makeshift mason's workshop and promptly have him make as many doors as possible. Head shoots is officially in lockdown mode. LCQC doesn't seem to give a damn, though, and proceeds to go fishing at the local brook, which I'm sure flows with the black blood of the undead. Wherever in Armok's name we are, we picked a doozy of a spot. We have two magma deposits, and Swat Jester swears he saw a chasm from the ridge we approached this valley from. There's also the bottomless pit to nowhere, too. Great, more nasty monsters to be our neighbors. 14th of Granite, 106. Damn it, LCQC! LCQC, Dusim Steris, Carpenter, cancels store item and stockpile. Interrupted by Skeletal Fire Imp. LCQC got trapped by the Skeletal Fire Imp at the edge of a cliff, with no escape, barely having dodged two fireballs cast by the devious creature. With little choice, LCQC engaged the Imp in combat. As he bravely charged, he took a fireball to the face, before tumbling headlong into the Skeletal Fire Imp. Where's the fire coming from? The thing's made of bones! LCQC took a nasty beating and only cracked the right hand of the imp slightly before collapsing from the pain, probably from having his eye gouged out by a skeletal claw on fire. I briefly considered getting the fish he left behind. Rainbow trout is hard to come by when you live in a subterranean vault, but decided to hightail it back to the fortress. We started to refer to the foul murdering skeletal fire imp as Land's Lantern. Well... A rough start, but now with the doors locked and bolted and everyone safe behind, it can't get much worse. Can it? Herr Zwiebel posted, You won't last a year. What went through the minds of your doors when they stopped the cart? Hey, I bet we can put those flaming bony monstrosities into your still and make wicked fire demon brew. The last fortress I started under conditions this horrible ended with the last survivor going mad after a skeletal mandrel ate his pet kitten and going on a suicide charge into zombie elephants while naked and on fire. And it wasn't even autumn yet. Well, aren't you, Mr. Sunshine? 26 of Granite, 106. Even if we're surrounded on all sides by hideous undead, we at least have some potent resources at our disposal in the form of hematite and gold, both of which were unearthed as we dug a shaft down to where the quarters will be located. Once we were certain the imps have wandered off elsewhere, we quickly retrieved the remains of LCQC and the salmon he left behind. His noble sacrifice shall not be in vain. I'll finally have something to eat besides those damnable plumped helmets that grew back at Palm Lanterns. 23rd of Slate, 106 the miners, Verviticus and Mr. Greenshirt, have been tunneling through the mountain with impressive speed. Room for the first proper workshops has been made, and we immediately build a proper mason's workshop, as well as a mechanic's workshop. We are certainly not cowardly enough to resort to traps. But for a fledgling fortress like ourselves, a drawbridge between us and the hordes of the undead will be necessary, until we can fend for ourselves properly. Moto 42 begins work on the project post-haste. We also construct a carpenter's workshop. As LCQC is currently rotting outside of the fortress, note to self, bury him before he starts moving, Facial Butter is picking up carpenter duty in his stead. We have enough wood on hand to make some beds, and we had the foresight to bring more with us. But how we shall secure future lumber will be an utter mystery. There's also the matter of getting still parts for palm lanterns. I've almost forgotten about it completely. 11th of Felsite, 106. Praise to the miners indeed. An exploratory shaft has revealed underground deposits of sand. 
meaning we do not have to risk the outside world to grow ourselves food. Our planter, Swat Jester, will finally have something to do instead of mucking around in our temporary home. 24th of Hematite, 106. Finally, I'm back in something resembling civilization. As the brains behind this operation, I've taken the liberty of having the miners Reviticus and Mr. Greenshirt, who have been gaining skill alarmingly quickly, carve me out a modest little abode. It isn't much, but I'm not that picky, though the walls and floors will have to be smoothed without delay. So I was wandering through the tunnels today, seeing the new stuff that had been dug out, and I was so shocked at what I saw that I almost had a beard attack. Some wisecracker went and constructed a still. I tracked down the most likely culprit and expedition brewologist, Facial Butter, and asked him how he'd found the parts so quickly, and even more how he'd built the damn thing so soon. He looked at me like I was stupid and told me that all he needed were rocks. But don't we have a lot of rocks at Palm Lanterns? Well, yes. Then why have we wandered all the way out to this fetid hellhole, surrounded by flesh-eating undead, when we could have just used the rocks at home? Well, you see, they aren't the right kind of rocks. Then he starts going off talking about how the minerals present at palm landers make distillation come out wrong, and how the water is hard, and oh, Armok, the flavor needs to be just right. So why not haul some of these rocks back to palm lanterns? Do you want to haul several hundred pounds of rock on foot for a hundred miles? Hmm, point taken. Goodbye, Palm Lanterns. We hardly knew ye. They're not the most well-adjusted lot after spending so long so isolated, and to be frank, they were ready to start tantruming at the drop of a hat. Good riddance. We've got our booze. 18th of Malachite, 106. Well, our last pack animal won't be winning any horse races anytime soon. Lands Lantern 2, head shoots 0. We'll get you yet, you fiend. A stray horse, tame, has been severely injured. Its left rear leg is broken. First of Gulena, 106. Armok, help me. Moto 42 was working on the drawbridge when a skeletal large rat ambushed him and sent him running, not back inside, but clear out into the wilderness. Seeing how he's more likely to attract a crapload of undead running around like a retard, I can script him and have him try his luck against the oversized owl pellet. Moto 42 breaks off one of the beast's left legs at the knee, and then punches the thing in its right rear foot, sending it flying. This one's dwarf foo is strong indeed. Then he grabs and breaks off the rat's left front leg. It's almost like he's looking for a decent drumstick to eat. Note. We ran out of dog meat days ago and we forgot to bring some iguanas on a stick to compensate, so I'm not ruling out that possibility entirely. In his death throes, the rat lashed out and headbutted Moto 42 in his spine. I feared the worst, but luckily it was only bruised, and barring further injury, Moto 42 will remain useful. Fifth of Galena, 106, praised the miners indeed. You have struck raw adamantine. Praise the miners! Adamantine. Of all the places you'd never expect to find adamantine, we find it here, in this cursed place. That cements it. We ain't going nowhere. We can't use this stuff yet, but I order Moto 42 to wall off the vein between flashbacks. The tunnel we were digging was meant to channel magma to fuel the forges with, and we can't mine out the rest of the stuff if liquid rock is in the way. Seriously. This was a surprise. I hadn't used Reveal on the site, and I just dug right where I was considering the neighbors were so close by. We're going to have fun with this one, I think. 13th of Limestone, 106. Well, this was unexpected. A caravan from Besmar Rabed has arrived. Caravan? We're knee-deep in the dead, and some nutcase decides to send a caravan here? Where's this caravan even coming from? Looks like they were survivors of the Great Magma Flood of 27. Though, now that they've arrived next to a bunch of nasty undead naked mole dogs, I doubt they'll be surviving for much longer. Come on, guys, you can make it. Okay, probably not. But if you'd perish somewhere near the entrance to Hedchu so we can loot the corpses, we'd really appreciate it. 
Amazingly, the guards they brought with them dispatched of a great many zombies on their way in, and the caravan made it to our entrance, and quickly built depot for trade. Luckily, I had been making rock crafts to pass the time until my office was built, so we did have a few baubles to exchange for some drinks in a barrel, which we will need more of if we're to expand our food supply. I tell them of the plight of palm lanterns and their lack of booze. They probably ran out a couple months ago. Maybe they'll at least get something to drink now that we've made actual contact with the outside world. They also send a trade liaison, who I tell to bring wood. Lots of wood. 11th of Sandstone, 106. The magma has finally been channeled out, and our magma forge and smelter is up and running. Verviticus gets the honor of being head shoots and prompt metal worker. 10th of Timber, 106. Damn, Verviticus works quickly. Now that we're settling into the swing of things, I get to maintaining a count of everything we have on hand. Should this fort last through the year, it may become a full-time job. We've also excavated a few moats of adamantine, as we've been hollowing out storage halls and room for more workshops. We're not sure what to make the stuff into right now, even if we were, none of us really has the skill to make anything really good with it anyway. Moto 42 had another close call with the local wildlife in the form of a giant desert scorpion, and as usual he ran in the opposite direction of the fortress. The scorpion seemed really intent on getting inside, though, and stopped at our locked doors before wandering off affording Moto 42 the opportunity to sneak back inside. 67th of Timber, 106? I've lost total track of time, as I've been buried in records detailing what we have on hand and what we still need. I swear, Swatchester's sneaking some booze away from himself now and then because I am showing a one-eighth quart discrepancy in the books. Heads will roll once I find out who's responsible for this. My nose is so buried in another one of my record books that I hardly notice one of the other dwarves walk into my office. Uh, Throg. What? What is it? Can't you see that I'm trying to calculate the exact amount of granite pebbles we've accumulated? This is important. But, Throg, we haven't seen you for weeks, and you've been holed up in here, writing endless strings of numbers that don't mean anything. You're recting, just like the overseer back at poem lanterns. By your mac, we knew he was crazy to begin with, and all this great magma flood crap may have just been ramblings from a deranged mind. I fail to see your point. By the way, have you seen an errant salmon bone around here somewhere? Look, we need somebody to give this fortress direction, you imbecile. With you in here all the time, giving yourself a hunchback and arthritis, the rest of us have been standing around wondering what the hell we're supposed to be doing. Well, looks like you're in charge now, buddy. I'm too busy to babysit everybody when the fortress rests upon my records. Oh, and while you're out there, did you have everybody give their dirty dishes to me? Who knows how many extra biscuits we can squeeze out of pump helmet crumbs and drops left at the bottoms of ale mugs. These things must be catalogued, you know. I didn't bother looking up for my ledger during the conversation, and the nameless dwarf walks out of my office doing only Armak knows what. I tire of writing in this journal anyway. Think of all the paper and ink I'm wasting. <laughs>